I want to welcome everybody. This is the last presentation from this short camp meeting. Let's open with a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you. For many of us, this is the sacred Sabbath day. For some of us, we have entered into a new week. As we consider the new experience that awaits us, We want to ask for your guidance and your wisdom. We recognize that there are many things that we have yet to learn. But it's only through the structures and the lines that you have given to us and the confidence that we can have in your messengers that we can safely navigate through this perilous time. We pray for your guidance and your protection. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so I want to thank you for joining us. This is uh, part two of this weekend study. And we're discussing Acts 27. In yesterday's presentation, I spoke about two Old Testament stories the story of Elijah and the story of Hezekiah. I didn't give the Bible references. The story of Elijah begins at the end of 1 Kings chapter 18. And the main story is in chapter 19. And the second story I gave, Hezekiah, this story is found in Second Chronicles. Chapter 29 and 30. These are familiar stories to us. And as I said in the past, we used to study and present on these chapters in a lot of detail. I intimated the following point yesterday. but I want to reinforce it now. I 
I know week by week there are tens of studies that happen all across the world. A few of them are public, but most of them are going to be local private studies. So I don't have factual information. But I do have a sense, a feel of what's happening in the movement. And I believe that many of those old studies that were done pre Midnight Cry have been left by the wayside. And they're no longer spoken about or taught. And I understand why. So this is not a critique. But what I want to suggest, first of all, that the core information in those studies of old was correct. The symbology and what they, they meant, I think is still valid for us today. I'm certain that many of the applications that we made in the past are incorrect. And I explained why yesterday. It's because, it's because in the past, it's because in the past, we had a mindset of understanding things literally. And in our maturity, we have learned that that was incorrect. So yes, some of the applications that we were making were wrong. but that does not negate the validity of those studies, in my opinion. So the reason I'm mentioning this is because we're in a history at the moment that's pre-Sunday law, Borrowing a phrase from the spirit of prophecy. We are in the history of the agitation of the Sunday law. And I'm going to put an A here for agitation. So the word agitation means to speak about in an excited and a vigorous fashion. It means to shake, to agitate. And what's being shaken is a story. something that's happening in society. And it's, according to Ellen White, a prediction of what's about to happen in the future. The agitation of the Sunday law 
is before the Sunday law. And what the people of God are able to do And I'm defining the people of God in its broadest sense. According to the symbology on the board, it would be priests, Levites and Nethanims. But several years ago, I did a study. That was based upon a passage from the great controversy. Where I laid out what I think is an important logic. The theme of the study was degrees of inspiration. Different qualities of inspiration. But the focus or the conclusion of that study simply put for the point that I want to make now is that there were two types of prophets. The first type we'll say is us. The stone of Daniel 2. The 144,000. The second group. Second group of prophets. Are journalists. Those who read the news and when I say the news, I mean the events that are transpiring in front of them. Because that's what the news is. It's a factual event that's happening that gets reported on and when they report on that event we call that news and what many journalists can see especially those journalists that focus on opinions. Now, in my opinion, there's a difference between a news journalist and an opinion columnist. They used to call it columnists. So for translators, the word columnist is uh, developed from a newspaper where they would have a column on a certain page. So I want to suggest that journalists and us are in step with one another. Because we're both prophets. And the agitation in the public sphere is not done by us, it's done by journalists. And that was the point of that study, to demonstrate that.
So we're in the time of the agitation of the Sunday law. We know it's about to occur. Because of the events or the news that is occurring today. And the fact that we know that now, the fact that we know what the Sunday law will look like because we can see it being fulfilled today, like everyone else, we hear the subject being agitated in the world. at the same time that we're agitating it in the movement. The agitation doesn't mean that they are encouraging or making it happen. It's the reporting of it that we're discussing. Because we know that another way to look at the agitation is that it's occurring before our eyes. The subject is being discussed. And the only place, the only meaningful place that that discussion happens is on a political level. On a cultural level, and on an economic level. But all of those elements come together in politics. And that's why there is such a focus on our present studies about politics. It should be obvious to each of us that, that you're not going to be able to go to the Bible and spirit of prophecy to understand the details of politics today. Let me say, let me say it another way. The only way we can recognize the agitation of the Sunday law and talk about it, shout about it, give a cry here, is by understanding what's happening in the world. And the problem is inspired statements that are centuries old, are not effective tools in understanding the global and political dynamics that are happening. They're very crude and blunt instruments. They're not precise. It's like using a meat cleaver or a scalpel. So there's a cleaver which chops meat and there's a scalpel that delicately cuts it. It's what surgeons use. That's why there is so much focus in the movements, presentations and studies on politics. We're in a time period, if you want to understand what's really happening, you're forced to turn to 
I'm going to call it those external profits. Both those who report on the news and those who give opinions. Of course, we need to be careful when we're reading and discussing opinion pieces compared to news. Because they're not the same. So that's a brief explanation of why we focus so much on politics and news articles. This is not meant to be a rebuke, but it's an observation. Back in the day, in previous history, people didn't borrow Bibles from one another. Everybody possessed their own Bible. It was precious to them. People would say to get the best Bible that they could. And everybody made an effort to put those Bibles on their phone and on their computers. But today, when we have a different source of truth, we'll call it newspapers, people don't recognize the value of them. People are reticent to pay subscriptions to have access to them. They don't understand the point of reading articles and subscribing to quality journalism. And to me, it's an indication that people are not aware that we are in the agitation of the Sunday law. They may, they may have an intellectual assent to that, but they don't understand the implications. It should not come as any surprise to you. But after the midnight cry, the agitation, what did Elder Tess do? She immediately began doing Vesper studies. And I'm not saying this to tell anybody off. But it's the same criticism that I used to hear in the past. You open your Bible and people say this is too complicated. I don't understand. Elder Tess opens a news article and people say this is too complicated. I don't understand. In our maturity, we need to understand where to seek for truth. I'm not saying that the Washington Post has replaced the Bible. But without the New York Times, you cannot navigate your way 
through this history. Without the help of the Guardian, we won't be able to have our footsteps guided properly. Having said all of that, I think this is the opportune moment to go back in some of those old studies, dust the brush off them, and re-look at them. in the light of the events that are happening today. Because when those studies were done, maybe six years ago, they, they were pointing to this very time in which we're living. So we know the fulfillment But just because we're living in this history doesn't mean we understand what's going on. And what attests to that, what proves that point, is that vast swathes, vast numbers in this movement are still waiting. For what? It was my question yesterday. We're waiting for the Levites. Now I asked people to give me some feedback of why they think the Levites haven't come in. And I got what, what I want to do is I want to group the answers. I got a number of them into three categories. There is some overlap. One of the three was the one that I offered. We're a spiritual movement. Spiritual things must be spiritually understood. Now, even though I said, don't give me any negative answers. I got them. But people cloak them in nice language. Someone suggested, maybe we're wrong. There are no priests, Levites, or Nethanims. But I already said yesterday that we have not made any mistakes. Acts 27 demonstrates that. So that was one category. We've done something wrong. We're still in our sins. We're not ready. We're not fit. So there was another set of answers. And I want to call this progressiveness, the progressives. They said, just hold on a little longer because they're going to come in soon. But the reason they're not here is because we need a bit more time. Now, I want to challenge that view too. 
We don't have any time. The work has been done. The line of the Levites is rapidly coming to its completion. The Sunday law is upon us. How do I know? Because the prophets are declaring it to be so. Read the newspapers. The future is already being discussed in the events of today. So we know the Sunday law cannot be far away. So the third answer was that things won't appear as we're expecting them to be. So that's obvious because they're not here. So somewhere in our modeling, we have got a wrong concept of what the end of the world will look like. I want to read a spirit of prophecy quote. from the great controversy, if you can begin to get to that book. So we're in the great controversy and it's page 588, paragraph one. I've put it on the Zoom forum for translators. So I'm going to begin reading. I'll read the whole paragraph and then it'll give the translators time to locate it and read after me. Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp their hands with the Roman power. Under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling the rights, in trampling on the rights of conscience. Right, controversy 588, paragraph one. So I mentioned before that I did a study on journalists being prophets.
And my good friend has just told me that that was done in a Brazilian camp meeting in 2020. Which I think was in February of that year. So the great controversy quote, speaks about a threefold union. I want to read another quote now. And this is taken from Testimonies to the Church, Volume 9. I'm going to assume that not every language has this, so I'm going to read this one out step by step. Quoting. The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world. And the final movements will be rapid ones. So the reason why I have quoted these two uh, passages from the spirit of prophecy is because it speaks about three entities three powers coming together they're consolidating which means packing together and combining. So they're combining, joining forces and coming really close so they become a single unit. This is present tense. And they're doing this in preparation. And by coming together, they become stronger. In unity, they find strength. And they're strengthening themselves for the last crisis. If you look contextually, this is talking about the Sunday law period into the time of trouble. She says great changes will take place. And then it says the final movements will be rapid. there will be an information overload. If you review the amount of information that Elder Tess has shared over the last four years, from the midnight cry to today, Not just the quantity, but the scope of her studies are vast. And it's all happening in rapid succession. I want to suggest. If we're waiting for the Levites to come and think it's going to happen soon. Because the Sunday, because the Sunday law is distant, 
I just want to say that that is wrong. And I say that in a strong fashion, it's wrong to have that, to hold that view. Great controversy. Ellen White speaks about two great errors. Immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness. She attributes the former immortality with an ideology or a doctrine of what she calls spiritualism. And then she speak and then she speaks about Sunday. And she identifies that as the connecting link with Catholicism. Her focus of attention is, she says, the Protestants of America, but I'm going to say Protestant America. The Protestants take the initiative. And the initiative is that they're going to join with spiritualism and join with the papacy. And they can't do that. Because there's a gulf between one and there's an abyss with the other. Both words are in the in the passage. So there's a gulf and there's an abyss so that they can't come together. But the Protestants, by stretching out their hands, are able to bridge that gulf. So we know that the issue of Sunday is not the driver to bring them together at the end of the world. We know that for that dispensation in which Ellen White writes, it was OK. But we're living in a different world. A new reform line. And the dynamics between the relationship of the United States, the Protestants and the Roman power is different. There's something else that brings them together. So what I want to suggest is the thing that brings all of these three parties together is not Sunday, and it's not the immortality of the soul. These are not new age people. This, this is language and imagery that's borrowed from the Bible. Straight from the book of Genesis. God rested on the Sabbath, not Sunday. And the serpent 
deceives God's children by speaking about the immortality of the soul. Both of these two elements have a common theme. In the language of Genesis, it's the following. Ye shall be as gods. You shall be gods. You can do things your way. You are in control. You are in charge of your lives. So today, the thing that joins them together, if you look at what's happening in the world, is a word that we use frequently now in the movement. What binds these three groups together is a common factor or a common world view. Spiritualism, Protestantism and Catholicism. In the Bible, the imagery is different, but they're the same groups. The dragon, the false prophet and the beast. And we all know the answer to my question. The way they're able to bridge this gap And it's the Protestants that are at the center of all of this. Is that they all share the same culture. That's the word we use, culture. I'll phrase it a different way. Their worldview are, their world views are so similar that they overlap. Now, there are always going to be differences, otherwise there wouldn't be three groups. But their forces have been combined and they have consolidated, become one. They have one mind, as the Bible says. We use the word culture or worldview. We can speak of the patriarchal system. The evidence has been clearly laid out in the studies that Elder Tess has done. What joins those three powers together is they all have a patriarchal worldview. Men at the top, women at the bottom. The older are preferred before the younger. Racism is part of this patriarchal hierarchy. You get alpha males, the top males, and all the males underneath them.
I hope we're all familiar with the concept of the alpha male. It's an ugly model. I hope we all recognize that. But I want to remind us that when you speak to a man who is older than you, that has no blood family ties to you, when you, in the name of respect, I'm not sure if you have this word in your language or you know what it means, but you pay deference to the older man. If you don't have the word, it doesn't matter. You're submissive to him. And you acknowledge that by calling that man your uncle. or elder, when you participate in that culture, you're holding on with both hands to the patriarchal system. And you cannot ex escape the condemnation of that fact. by calling that man's wife, auntie. That's not equality, that's a hierarchical, patriarchal system. When we go to an older person and we call them elder, Not because of their position in the church, but because their position in society. We are participating and acknowledging the patriarchal system. And we're part of this threefold union. You could go to the home of any one of those three people. An atheist, a Protestant or a Catholic. And their homes would be the same. They would operate in the same way. Now, if you were to ask those people, the three groups, ask a Catholic who's being honest with you, if you already acknowledge and see in your mind that they have joined forces, Ask them the following question. Is there salvation in atheism? Is there salvation in Protestantism? And if they're not being politically correct, they will tell you, of course there isn't. There's only salvation in Catholicism. Ask an atheist. You know that they, I'll use the word dislike or disagree with Protestants and Catholics because they do not believe in God.
and the Protestants will say atheists are lost. And they don't agree with all of the pageantry and the errors of Catholicism. So my simple question, are these three groups friends? Do they like one another? Do they believe in one another? Do they uphold the views of one another? And the simple answer to all of those questions is no. They hold the other groups in contempt. So they're not friends at all. So either these passages are untrue or we're not in that history and it's about to happen in the future. Or our understanding of what this combining and consolidation will look like is wrong. Now, it's not a coincidence that there are three entities. Because on the board, there are also three entities. that will all combine, that will all consolidate, and that will strengthen themselves for the last great crisis. And there is a gulf and an abyss between them. So if you just take the parallel, I'm going to call it of the external. With the internal. And compare them. You can begin to see what is going to happen with relate with the relationship between these three groups. You're not going to get a Sunday service at a Protestant church. And all these atheists are going to pour in through the door and sit down and listen. What binds them together is their world view. But they're all doing their own thing in their own way. And I'm suggesting it's the same with these groups. This idea that they're all going to pour into our fellowships and our numbers are going to swell and it's all going to look rosy and beautiful, I believe is wrong. What brings these people together is their culture, their worldview. Now, culture is a big subject. And there are many things that we, culturally speaking, would not agree with. I'm speaking about the priests, Levites and Nethanims. But I'm suggesting. That as they see the events unfolding. 
the three groups are seeing things in the same way. You already know that. 99.9% .9 of all of those profits are in the world. They're not in the church. They're not even Adventists. And they see things exactly the same way as we do. We have a symbiotic relationship. But we live very different and separate lives. If we can see that with the priests and the Nethanims, the Levites won't be any different. I'm not condoning bad behavior. I'm not saying it's okay to hold on to wrong ideas. I'm not saying there's safety in rejecting the midnight crime message. These are all a death sentence for the individual. But this is the movement of success. Now you may not believe it, But the individual members in this movement are not worse today than they were yesterday, last year, or five years ago. Besides those who, those who are growing, the others are just stagnating. We're as bad as we've always been. But as we understand the sinfulness of sin, people look worse than they did in the past. One thing the story of Acts 27 teaches us clearly. is the distinction between the institution and the individual. And the story of the priests, sorry, the priests are an institution, it's the church of God. So whilst individuals are failing both men and women in our movement, it doesn't mean that the movement is in a failure. And it doesn't mean we're not getting Levites joining us because we are in sin. So I just wanted to lay out that argument, which is my response or my answer to why there are no Levites. Things will look very different. But give us a really simple example. Why was 1884 such an important year? You ask two people that question. And depending on who they are, you will get a different answer. You 
you could be in this movement from 1989 to 2018. I think that's 29 years, if my math is right. And ask any priest, why is 1844 so important? And they'll tell you, October 22nd. They'll tell you that was gonna be the close of probation. The second advent was gonna happen. The, the day of atonement. But if you ask another person, they will tell you that 1844 was perhaps the pivotal moment in American history. Talvez essa pessoa vai te dizer que foi um grande momento na história da América. In the 19th century. No século XIX. Because there is an election that year and that changes the course or the direction that America is going to head. And if you're in the movement for those 29 years, you would have heard nobody speaking about the US election of 1844 and its significance. And what you may not be aware of, but it's obvious when you think about it, The Millerites knew an election was happening in November, one month after they said Christ was about to return. Not literally a month, it's just October to November, one month. And what was their argument? You can ignore the election because it's not going to happen. The world is going to end before the election comes, so we don't have to worry about it. So, there has been an enormous change in the views and understanding that this movement has of end time prophecy. We're not a movement of failure. And even though there are individuals in this movement who are not accepting the midnight crime message, it doesn't negate the machinery of prophecy. God's will is being done. As is Satan's. And the forces of good and evil are consolidating. The priests, Levites, and even the Nethanims today are joining forces. They're coming together. Now, what does just say something? It's a random thought, but it should be obvious to us. If we're in the agitation of the Sunday law, that means the events in the world are agitating that subject. And the prophets of God 
or commenting on it, externally and internally, then we know that one of those three groups, the Protestants, who combine forces with, the, with spiritualism and Catholicism, because they have the same worldview, that means by the Sunday law, they will have come together. And when they come together and there will be a Sunday law, what we must know is the following. That they will be in power in the United States. Spiritualism. Protestantism and Catholicism will be in power because that's the only way they can enforce the Sunday law. You must all know that I'm using the word Sunday law symbolically, of course. There will not be a, a law or about Sunday. The issue is being agitated now. Both in the wider society across the world, particularly in America, and the midterm elections. are a component of this story. And so what I'm saying, that in the Sunday law history, we know that the Republican party has to be in power. This is not speculation, we already have enough information to demonstrate that. They already had a dry run, a practice earlier. The, presence, the presidency of Donald Trump was a practice run for the real thing. We know that the Democrats are in power at the moment. So there has to be a transfer of power. And the transfer of power happens every four years in the United States. So you know it either has to happen in two years or six years. We can glean all of this from the agitation and from those inspired passages that we've read. But we can also see it in the line of the priests, Levites and Nethanims. We're in this history And we can see the experience of the Levites and the Nethanims. And we are combining and consolidating our forces on the test. We are combining our 
forces and strengthening. But I, I don't believe we're going to be coming together in the way that many of us are expecting. Mm -hmm. So we've come to the end of our study. And there was still at least one or two points more that I wanted to bring up in the story of Acts 27. So if I and you can hold on to our thoughts, until we meet again together, and if I can, remember the trajectory that I'm going down, the next time I present, I'll try to continue this study. Let's close with a word of prayer. Holy God, we thank you. I thank you. As we come together as your people, as an institution, we also come as individuals. Individually, may each of us examine our lives understand the test that is not only before us, but is present with us. The test of patriarchy. May each of us consecrate ourselves to understand the finer points, the details of what this message means. so that we might reform our lives as a body of people we all pray together and we want to uplift elder test to you we ask that you would guide and bless her and that you would strengthen her physically, mentally and spiritually. As she sees events unfolding in the world, as we do, May she be comforted in the knowledge that there are people in your movement who are understanding and preparing. And we thank you that not only are the priests getting ready, but in their own way, in their own experience, so the Levites and Nethanims. We thank you for the story of Acts 27. In Jesus' name, amen.
I want to thank you, each of you. Je voudrais vous remercier tous. It's been a real blessing um, seeing faces and fellowshipping with you. C'était vraiment un réel, euh, une bonne une bénédiction d'adorer de, 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 well. ensemble. Say bye to everybody. Alors, euh, au revoir tout le monde.